We're going to start in just a few moments, everybody. Um, as it would be, our author is signing a book right now. For the president. So yes, we'll yield to that. <laughs> If you can find a seat, that's fine. I think we have a couple more seats in the back. First, let me just do some checking. Can everyone hear? Can you hear in the back? Everyone's good? All right. So I am Christy Kinney, Director of Development at the Fort Valley State University in the Department of University Advancement. And I want to thank you all for coming out. We will have our official welcome, but I would be remiss if I didn't stand up here and thank everyone for coming out. Um, Dr. Hodges, I would say, is near and dear. Um, we are fellow Trojans. He, um, yes, we can woo woo for that. Yeah! yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's a fellow Trojan. Um, he graduated long, long before me. Long, 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 two years, long, long before I did. <laughs> but um, we definitely have an affinity for Peach County high school. Um, when he wrote the book, um, first thing I did was call and say, let's have a book sign. She did. Go ahead, put it together, Crystal, whatever you want. That's music to my ears. Anybody who says whatever you want, I'm going to do it, right? So, but if you get a chance, and some of you will get a chance to read the book, I tell you, um, I am so happy that he's transparent about his successes and his failures. Um, usually people charge for that to be transparent, but he's so willingly to give. And if I'd step up, go a step further, I am, I told him yesterday that it's a blessing that he is being obedient. And you will understand as you walk through life, the importance of being obedient to something higher than you. Okay? All right, so without further ado, I'm going to bring out Mrs. Mahogany Joyner, who's going to give us our welcome. Mahogany. Good evening, everyone. I am Mahogany Joyner, a senior biology major and member of the Fort Valley State University Science Club. It is my distinct honor and high privilege to welcome you to the author series, an evening of reading, conversation, and autographs featuring our very own alumnus, Dr. Bernard Hodges. I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us for this occasion. It is so wonderful to be in company and to be a part of um, you all, all the Fort Valley State students and administrators and Wildcat friends. I am extremely excited about this program and grateful that we have a platform like the author series which allows us to conduct intellectual dialogue with scholars, activists, and philanthropists, and visionaries like Dr. Hodges. We all know that we learn best by visualizing hard work in a tangible form. In other words, if I can see success in action, I know that success is possible. I would personally like to thank the Department of University Advancement for partnering with the H.A. Hunt Library to sponsor this author series. This quintessential event gives me hope that maybe one day I could be a feature author. I like the sound of that. As we relax and prepare to receive our author, let's first take out our phones and make sure they are placed on mute. Once again, I appreciate you all for coming out and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Ms. Joyner. And we will now have Ms. Latoria Blackwell, who will give the introduction of our speaker. Ms. Blackwell. Good evening. I am Latoria Blackwell, a senior media studies major. I take great pleasure in introducing our speaker for the hour, Dr. Bernard L. Hodges. Dr. Hodges is a native of Fort Valley, Georgia, and a product of the Peach County Comprehensive School System. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Fort Valley State University and earned his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from Tuskegee University. 
A man who came from very humble beginnings is currently the founder and owner of multiple successful veterinary hospitals. All started from his vision to provide world-class service to his patients. Dr. Hodges consider, considers himself a serial entrepreneur and has won several awards for his business acumen. However, his personal goal is to continue teaching how to create generational wealth. How you ask? By betting on yourself. He is an active member of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated and 100 Black Men of Middle Georgia. But here is a fact that is more important to me. He is an active donor and supporter of the Fort Valley State University. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome veterinarian, real estate entrepreneur, community leader, and philanthropist, Dr. Bernard L. Haji. <laughs> Better yourself from zero to millions. I want to tell you guys a little bit about my story. I'm a product of Fort Valley, Georgia. And if you look, look at me now, you see a guy who looks really polished and looks like he has it all together, but trust me, it hasn't always been that way. I grew up living in a trailer not far from here. I'll never forget that trailer. It had a two foot hole in it in the floor with a sheet of raised plywood. My auntie remembers. <laughs> I hated that hole. I did everything I could to hide that hole because it was a, it was embarrassing. I never met my biological father. I wouldn't know him if he was in this room today. Um, my first job was picking pizzas in the pizza field for 35 cents a bucket. And I could pick about two buckets an hour. <laughs> so I made about 70 cents an hour, 70 cents an hour in the Georgia Hot Sun. I learned early school wasn't designed for kids like me. But it really will hit home when I failed in ninth grade. I failed because I didn't care, and I felt like nobody else cared. But you know, but I, I just I just wanted to run the streets with my friends. However, harsh reality hit me when one of my best friends was locked up and put in the penitentiary. I knew I had to turn it around, or that fate awaited me. Through the grace of God and from a, frail, a failing student, I ended up graduating from here, Fort Valley State University, and also graduating from one of the most prestigious veterinary schools in the country. I was able to turn around and flourish because of hard work and great mentors like this lady right here. I had a choice early on to follow the pathway of easy money, running the streets, but instead I chose to educate and bet on myself and gain the tools that I needed to succeed. I now own my own veterinary, line of veterinary practices, real estate, apartment buildings, stock portfolio that pays me millions of dollars. But my story is really not about the financial realms. It's about being rich in my soul, being rich in my friends, and enriching my community. When you're better yourself, your actions start to change. But let's face it, you know, everybody doesn't bet on themselves. I've been there. There's something powerful that happens when your thoughts and actions allows you to start betting on yourself. And if I had to boil it down from the actions in my book, I would give you a few pieces of advice. I would say start with yourself. Yeah. This works whether you're someone young or someone that it's just, it's a little older and looking for more things that can better yourself. I chose, I chose self, the better my self-education. If anyone asks me, how do you get ahead in life? You must first, like I say, begin with yourself. Those are the only actions and thoughts that you can control. Each day you have a choice. You can play video games, you can watch TV, or you can read a book or listen to a podcast that makes you wiser. No matter the circumstances, you are in control of that and what you consume on a daily basis. That's what betting on, on yourself really is about, all about. It's about finding ways to invest in yourself and come out richer in the end, both financially and soulfully. 
Second, connect with your passion. And you know, whatever your investment, make it your passion. No matter what your hustle is, I know the young kids know Ace Hood, right? Hustle hard. Hmm. Learn it, work it, and be great at it. I had a chance to follow Easy Money, but that, like I said, that wasn't the way that it worked out for me. And, and fortunately, God had another plan. Third, the message is, my third most important message is about my young, to my young audience. Seek out people in your life who are willing to bet on you. Part of my story is that I had mentors along the way. And y'all don't know what this lady means. Positive One last thing before we get to the book reading. I'm also a proud father. My son was born when the stock market was bottoming up. I lost over a million dollars. Anybody ever lost a million dollars? You know what that feels like? <laughs> Even though that was a low point financially, I felt rich looking down that crib. I knew that we were going to be okay. I knew that his father was a hustler, and I would find a way to get it back, and I did, and more, because I believed in me. I knew looking at him in that crib that I had to teach him to be a man and bet on himself. And if he listened, he wouldn't have any problems. <laughs> Today I want everybody to make a commitment and bet on yourself. Whether it's school, job, buying real estate, or starting that business that you always want. Just read the book and read other books that stimulate your mind and help you take control and choose to bet on yourself. Find something that works for you. I learned this poem about 30 years ago, and I still talk about it today. <clears throat> it goes, somebody said it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe he couldn't, but he wouldn't be the one who say so until he tried. So he buckled in with a bit of a grin, and if he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tapped the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Someone scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one's ever done it. So he took off his coat and took off his hat, and before we knew it, he begun it. With a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin. If he would have lifted his chin and a bit of a grin without a doubt and acquitted, he started to sing in top of the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Thousands will tell you it can't be done, thousands will prophecy failed. Thousands will tell you one on one of the dangers that wait to assail you. So just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Take off your coat and go to it. 
start to sing as you tackle the thing that couldn't be done, and you'll do it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, we'll start with some readings. I have some people who are in my book. These people have played a pivotal role in my life. You all right there, fellas? This guy right here got me fired. If you read the book, this is the guy that got me fired. So we'll start with, uh, I'm starting with two worlds. The Beastie Boys, Run DMC, Easy, e and the Fat Boys were just starting. We all wanted to be rappers. None of us ever were. I'd still love to be a rapper. Success in my community was working at Bluebird. A lot of my friends worked there. Some of them still do. When I was growing up, the work at Bluebird was hot and demanding. There was no air conditioning. It was hard physical labor, welding, putting on tires. But if you got a job there, you, you was considered to be doing great. It paid almost twice as much as jobs in my hometown. But there were hurt things there too. Through the grapevine, we found out there was a swimming pool at Bluebird. We never even, we never even saw it because it's for whites only. After long, grueling days of football practice in Georgia, in the Georgia sun, we would go home and cool out with our water sprinklers, or our white teammates would go, home, go chill at the free private Bluebird pool. It was just another humiliation we learned to accept growing up in the deep south. My high school prom was also segregated. That was the, that was, that was the way it was even into the 90s. There was a white prom and there was a black prom. I had no idea that, where whites had their prom. We went to classes together, but any co-mingling at the prom wasn't tolerated. We raised money for our black prom. Those just were the times. It made me feel inferior. But as a group, it made us love each other more and become stronger. As you can see, some of my classmates are here. I love y'all. <laughs> Until recently, my mother lived in the home I grew up in. A year ago, I went to the local hardware store downtown to get supplies to fix plumbing leaks, a plumbing leak at her house. I've been in that store many times as a kid, but it had been a while since I had visited the store. I forgot what it felt like to be followed around as if I was still something. It brought back those old childhood memories of being inferior. But then I smiled, said a small prayer, and thought to myself, if I wanted to, I could buy this whole damn story. <laughs> so that's just an, that's an insert from there, but that talks a little bit about how we kind of grew up. But you know, it doesn't it doesn't make you bitter. You know, it should just make you strong. I mean, Christy, Miss Rue, it just it just makes you strong. And that's 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 the key. And you know, just just keep pushing. Now, I'll read a second, second, I'm second, right? Ms. Root? Yeah, you want. All right. We'll talk about a new path. Ms. Pettis, can you stand? My godmother, Ms. Rosa Pettis, was in charge of developmental studies at Fort Bell State. She had nothing against me going into the military, but she wanted me to give college a try. She told me about the Middle Georgia Consortium a workforce development agency. She told me how I would, I would pay for me to take the SAT, they would pay for me to take the SAT and pay for my first semester in college. If it hadn't been for Ms. Pettis, I would never have understood this resource existed. I thought, if it won't cost me anything, I'll try. Mm -hmm. Ms. Pettis fills out all, filled out all the paperwork and made it easy for me. The SAT wasn't that hard. Okay, I barely passed, but I got it. <laughs> People usually come to school in fall, but we were on the quarter system. So I, I attended summer school, and uh, so I could pledge of return in that spring quarter, I, that fall and winter. I became the youngest to pledge the mighty Upsilon Sigma for Mega Sci Fi. It's been one of the greatest decisions of my life. The men of the mighty US are a special group. I can imagine I'd be without them. This group. Understand why this lady is so special. Mm -hmm. 
She has her own chapel called Dr. Davis. <laughs> When I went to college, I had no idea what I would do. I started just taking general education courses and then chose agriculture as a major. It was at this time I met one of the most influential people in my life, Dr. Melinda Davis. To this day, I think of her as my guardian angel. She was a Caucasian lady from Oklahoma and received a PhD from a large university, Oklahoma State University, by the way. <laughs> she had come to our small HBCU to make an impact. Actually, I just came because of giving a job. <laughs> <laughs> and did she make one? Dr. Davis had the single most impact on my education. She was my college advisor. She took a genuine interest in me. She wasn't just my mentor, she was my friend. Often during my free time, I would hang out in her office. Dr. Davis was a tough teacher. She was diligent and she pushed me to do better. His philosophy was, hey, is he's passing? <laughs> Thank God for her because she believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. One day I stopped by her office. I told her I was interested in fish and about my experience with koi from working with my dad. She talked about marine biology and showed me some of the coursework. She suggested fisheries biology and aquaculture would be a good major for me. So I switched. Figure it's easier to learn something I'm already curious about. After long nights of partying, I missed classes a few times. My fraternity house was on the route to Dr. Davis's office. On more than one occasion, she stopped by the frat house, knocked on my door, came in, woke me up, get your ass in class. <laughs> but tough Lowe's was exactly what I needed. She never gave me a grade, but she always gave me love. Her care helped me believe in myself. She was mentoring me to be a college student, and so my confidence grew and my grades improved. Very good. Anybody want to ask Dr. Davis any questions about our relationship or whatever? Any questions? Here. Just through each section, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Um, I have one. Yes. What was it, Dr. Davis? What was it about this person who was content on being mediocre. <laughs> what, what was it? What, what gave you that special interest? Actually, that poem you just read, that bit of a grin, he's always had that bit of a grin. Mm -hmm. And he's always uh, had more to him than he ever believed he did. Mm -hmm. so it was evident to most of us, even when it wasn't evident to him. Very good. Very good. It's good to have that mentor. That's why we stress that students. Um, sometimes you need someone to look past yourself and can see past what you're doing and give you that push. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. Um, next, we have Vet School, read by Dr. Ferguson, page 47. Good evening. First of all, I want to say that uh, I'm very proud of you. career-wise, and I wouldn't want to be joined to anyone else but Dr. Hodges. He uh, challenges me, even in my older age, so I appreciate that. appreciate everything. Mm -hmm. Veterinary school. I try to read it. I forgot my glasses. I'll go on as best I can. <laughs> um, I, had come, I had my come-to-Jesus moment on my first day in veterinary school. I went to the College of Tuskegee University College of Veterinary, Veterinary Medicine in Alabama, the only veterinary medical program at an HBCU in the United States. Dr. Goyel, a distinguished teacher, arrived in class with a grocery cart full of papers. He was pushing it up and down the aisles filled with syllabus packages. He said, take a syllabus. I reached in, pulled out a few papers. He said, no, 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 no. Take the whole package. That package must, must have weighed 10 pounds. That was the moment I realized <coughs> school would be more demanding than I thought. Than I thought, And I was right, but I wasn't about to be a quitter. People want to be veterinarians because they love animals. Many of us grew up around critters and loved them. 
But when we got uh, to our first gross anatomy class on the first day, on the first year of veterinary school, and we're given a dog to dissect, for some people, it was all too much. It, it was a little rough there. The freshman year was designed to weed out students, and the first big test of staying power was gross anatomy. Let me explain gross anatomy. Yeah, explain okay. so it. So when you come to veterinary school, of course you need to know what things look like in order to be able to treat it. So gross anatomy is just what it sounds like. It's um, grossly what you see in an animal, and it's pretty gross when you first do it. That's not why they call it gross anatomy, but it's kind of gross. So when you first arrive, you um, first semester, you get a dog that's in a bag, and you bring him out, and from there you have to dissect all the way through the animal. But um, it, it, it's, it's, it's challenging when you first get there to just be presented a dead dog. So we spent the first three hours of the day in gross anatomy lab. We called it the pit, a cold, concrete, windowless room in the basement. Funk and formaldehyde fill the air. <laughs> I never want to have to go back to that again. They gave us an anatomy book and a dead dog to dissect. We worked in pairs. One of us read from the book, the other dissected every vein and muscle in our dog. It was tedious work. Not everyone made it. My second year was a lot of work. I struggled with theory. I still had a dream of being a fish doctor. After four weeks of intense study, we took blocks of tests every day for the next week. But the beauty, beauty of it was, after every block of test, we had a big party. Even though I was in veterinary school, I still was a party. <laughs> <laughs> Physiology was extremely hard for me. There was a lot of memorization and figuring out how uh, various body systems work. I was struggling. So when I was called before the academic council, I was worried. I was just scraping by. But they said they wanted me to succeed. Not everyone learns the same way, they told me. So they assigned me a tutor for my third year class. I would be, I would be forever grateful to my tutor, Dr. Andrew Woods. Today, Dr. Terrence Ferguson is my trusted business partner. He is an excellent uh, animal surgeon. We are good friends. We were good friends at Fort Valley. He was also a good athlete, a college quarterback. We were together at Tuskegee where we paired um, big brother, little brother. Terrence was my little, little brother, even though he is slightly older. I was year, a year ahead of him in school because um, he came in a year after I did. Terrence was Mr. Academic. So Terrence was Mr. Academic and a good, good problem solver. I've always admired him. He leads from the front and was class president of his class for four years at Tuskegee. His success shows how much people admire him and took to him for leadership. I'll always, I'll, I'll, I'll be saying more about him later in the next chapter. During my third year of vet school, my teachers saw I could figure out problems. So I got a little extra hands-on experience. They were always putting me out of class to go on pet calls with them. That's when things clicked. By the end of my fourth year, I was making good grades, even a few A's. <laughs> I won tons of awards at our senior banquet. I received a, received a framed Norman Rockwell painting with my name engraved on it. The, the faculty voted me as the most proficient class member in the large animal medicine. I guess the light bulb had come on. Later is better than never. All right. Seriously, as I said, we've been we've been we've been partners for about twenty years. Um, we, honestly, we never had an argument. I'm sure he, he got on my nerve before, and I'm sure I, I'm sure I got on his. But we, honestly, we've never had an argument ever in twenty years. I mean, I, I couldn't have picked a better part. Uh, circumstances brought us together. You know, we were here, and we've always been friends. When we were just, and, and this is where you're going to meet your, your partners for life, you know. We were, we were friends at Fort Valley. We'd always talk about things. We'd always talk about veterinary medicine. We were vet techs at the same place. You know, we, we, we had our own identities, and, but we always were, were, were cool friends. We didn't know that we'd be 
sitting here 20 years later as, a, as partners. You know, I mean, what I write on here, everything I've written in this book is true. And he didn't know it. He didn't know what was in the book. He got a call one morning. I said, hey, dude, I'm writing the book. You in <laughs> That's how it went. And he said, as he always did, okay. <laughs> And that's usually, that's how, you know, that's how our conversation kind of go. Because I trust him and he trusts me. And he didn't say, well, what, you know, what's the deal? So what do you attribute um, your long-lasting relationship to? Respect? Respect. You, 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 you can't do this without respect. Um, no, no matter what. You know, I think of his feelings and he think of my feelings. I mean, that's, that's just business. I mean, it, you know, it's, it was business. Honestly, this is, this is true. I can remember when we started, and he was sitting there, and we we walked dogs, we answered the phone, we did this. I said, I said, hey, dude, I'm going to the store. He stayed there and did this all by himself. I came back with a little bit of praise. I came back with a loaf of bread and some turkey and some cheese. Remember that? Yep. I said, this is what we eat for the week. <laughs> that, that's that's how it went. That, that, that's that's the truth. He didn't say, hey, man. We need to take these few coins we got. He said, I, I take my with mayonnaise. I mean, he made his own sound. But, but seriously, that's that's how we struggle. That's you know, people like I say, people see us now. But that, that's the truth. That's you know, we come in. I look at him and say, What's up, bro? What's up, bro? We walk the dog. We answer the phones. Kim, appreciate you. Kim, come in every now and then. Stand up, Kim. <laughs> She helped. Tell who Kim. Kim. Tell who Kim. Dr. Ferguson's wife. All right. She stand up. She helped sometimes. Kim is Dr. Ferguson's wife. Wave your hand one more time. Okay. Glenda, <laughs> <laughs> okay. stand up. She helped sometimes. Here's not in. And it still is our partnership, and I'm half a critter fix. He's half a critter fix. It's all right. So we're about to move. Um, I absolutely love this story on page 50. Stop, look, think, and listen. So this is a true story. Mm -hmm. Vet school, as y'all figured out, was a challenge on more than one occasion. I learned to stop, look, and listen. One day our professors took a group of us, six students on an ambulatory call. That's when you just kind of go out and leave the school. Maybe we, was, maybe we was 45 minutes away. We went in a field of dead cows. It was a humid 103 Alabama afternoon. When we got there, we saw about 50 cows laying around that tree. Our professor asked us, why did all these cows die? We looked at each other. You didn't know. He said, no one had answers. And they smelled nasty. They had already started to rot. And I saw a possum come out one of their books. It was gross. <laughs> An autopsy, you know, if you watch TV, you hear autopsies performed on humans to discover the reason for death. For animals, it's called a necropsy. So we cut up the cows in that field to discover what was going on. It was a hot, horrible, messy, stinking job. Meanwhile, our teacher was sitting in the truck laughing at us. After a while, he called us over. Well, have y'all figured it out yet? We offered all kinds of unlikely solutions. He said, one thing you need to learn about veterinary medicine is to stop, look, listen, and think. Notice what's happening. He said, look, look at the dead cows all around that tree. It's a hot day. What happened yesterday? Yesterday had been a storm. Yesterday there had been a storm. He said, look at the top of the tree. And there was a solution. 
The tree had been struck by light, and the cows had been sheltering underneath. They had all been electrocuted. We could have saved ourselves a lot of work. <laughs> this experience taught me a lifelong lesson. Stop, look, listen, and think. Through hands-on experience, I could see how theory and practice was all fitting together. Even though the school curriculum wasn't designed for someone like me, I realized God had put me on earth to do his work. All right. <laughs> So yeah, that was that was that was good. I mean, I learned a lot. Sometimes, sometimes is uh, in life, you just need to stop, evaluate your situation, think about it, and make it work. And close your mouth. Close, close your mouth. Your mouth. No doubt. Right. Just just right. listen. Right. Just just right. just listen. Right. <laughs> Seriously, just just stop and listen. Right, we'll go. Who's next? Jackie. <laughs> Page 58. Don't you start trying. I ain't gonna, I'm trying not to cry. How y'all doing? Yeah. All right, so uh, Nod, Bay, Kidney, Julio, Big Dog. <laughs> These are just some of the names that we call Dr. Bernard Hart. I'm proud of this boy. I'm telling y'all now. Yeah, I'm right. so, I'm proud. I'm, I'm trying not to cry now. Okay, but now, when you first encounter Dr. Hodges, you know what you see, I mean, you can see that he got swag. I mean, homeboy wearing this Italian suit here. So, I mean, you can see he's got a good personality when you talk to him. You can tell he's smart. You know, you can tell he's an accomplished businessman. But two things that you might not be able not to, might not be able to tell from first encounter. And that's that, well, you probably will this first thing, is that he is down to earth. He talking about me and what I, yeah, he rolling like that. But he is down to earth. Whether you're a beggar on the street or the prestigious President Jones of this university, he treats everybody he meets with respect and kindness. And now that's the truth. Yeah. So now the second thing that you might not know about him from first encounter is that he has a heart. This boy has a heart, and it's probably a lot from his from his from his parents, but also from my mama right there. That's our backbone in our family right there. He has a heart, and she's always raised us to be spiritual and trust in God. And he has that. A very, very, very giving person. So now this passage that I'm about to read just shows you one instance of his kind heart. Can y'all hear me back there? Okay, okay. My cousin Jackie cried when I lost my job. Yes, I did. <laughs> she is the next best thing to a sister. She had bought a big antebellum house in Fort Valley. She told me she wouldn't charge me one dime to stay with her. I said, I, I got to give you something, but she said no. She was pivotal to my success at that vulnerable time. I didn't have to worry about a place to stay or even putting food on the table. But once I got established, and for many years after, I showed my thanks by paying Jackie's mortgage in December. That was my Christmas present to her. And I mean, that's just one of the many things that he shares with him, that he's given to his family. I mean, and friends. Woo. Okay, Christy, I, 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 it might not be on here, but I got to read this one other little passage. Go right in. Okay. Yes. I got to read this one other passage. Thank you. Okay. I think it's on the. Okay, here it is. Now, the child got a good foundation, see. His father was also a person. He, he worked at Fort Valley State University for many years, Dr. Highway. I, I don't know, you probably worked here when he did that thing, Dr. Highway. Came together. So, I mean, he was, he was here many, many years. He retired from here many years. You were too proud Dr. Steele. Dr. Ronald K. Abe. Now, this is a man who, he was not his biological father. But you wouldn't know that. Now, now if you look, you might kind of guess something um, and the milk wasn't clean. <laughs> but he was not his biological father. But in the ever sense of definition of the word, he was a daddy, father, papa, whatever you want to call, he raised this boy. 
And that's where his foundation comes from. So tonight, I just want to, he does mention his father in the book, and so tonight, I, I, I got to say something about my Uncle Ron. And I want to read just this little passage that's in here that he, he has about him. He says, uh, I remember being eight years, I, I remember being about eight when I asked him, Dad, why don't I look like you? I was a dark-skinned little chubby kid with short hair. He had lighter skin and black wavy hair like the guys I saw in karate movies. He said, he, he was Asian, he, I mean, he was uh, uh, Japanese, Japanese. So he says, look at me. I'm a descendant of samurai warriors. You're my special samurai warrior. God made you perfect. My dad was my hero. He gave me confidence. There was nothing I felt he couldn't do. We didn't talk about life much, he always led by example. He gave me a middle-class perspective on life. He showed me a different way of thinking from the culture most of my friends and I were living in. He was always interested in animals, and that's how I became interested in them. Uncle Ron. So it's always good to have someone to keep you centered, no doubt. keep you grounded, and to be just that um, spiritual refuge when you need it. So we're, we're giving you all, pouring some pearls into you, okay? So you have your takeaways on what you need to be. Success is whatever your level is. This is his level. You can be the successful teacher. You can be the successful administrator. <laughs> you can be the successful doctor. You can be the successful weed trimmer, whatever it is. But whatever it is, take God with you. And be a blessing to someone else. Amen. All right. So we're going to move on to loyalty, read by Paul. Good evening. I'm uh, really loyalty. Many of our employees have been with me for a long time. Some almost 20 years, and many over 10 years. It'll be 10 years next September. Loyalty is how I built my business. Your employees are the lifeblood of your business. They are in your inner circle, at least for me, they are anyway. I've been burned by the people I've let into my circle. That's why it's important to have one or two, or maybe three circles. Your innermost circle, um, allows you to sleep well at night. But people on your outer circle means that you need to sleep with one eye open. <laughs> Remember that. Loyalty is a matter of degree. The more material wealth you have, the more people want to get to know you. So you must surround yourself with people who truly are happy for your success. And know that if you are winning, the whole team is winning. I've been fortunate enough to attend many events, including the last six Super Bowls. My staff hasn't gone with me, Keep working on that. Uh, <laughs> last year, before I headed to Atlanta to see my Atlanta Falcons play in the big game, still sickening to talk about it. Me too. I, can I counted out $500 bills to each one of my employees. I told them to have a good Super Bowl weekend. I would have if they would have won. Um, I thought I was going to have to use that money to go out there and uh, fly, get a ticket, and go get him. I know he was sick as me. <laughs> I know I couldn't succeed without my dream team. Each one of them wants me to succeed. They understand their success depends on mine, which is true. We all want each other to win. When the hospital succeeds, everyone gets a bonus. Very nice. I will pay well. Ultimately, my goal is to take care of my people, and they repay you with loyalty. I'm loyal to my employees, and they are loyal to me. We have each other's back. My employees know I have their best interests at heart. I expect 100%, and they expect the same from me. Sometimes they do things wrong, but they know it's better to be chewed out than throw it out. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I can speak on behalf of Dr. Hodge's staff at Critter Fixer. He does take care of us. Yeah. And not only does he uh, take care of us, he's taught us how to take care of ourselves, all which right, is the most right, important all lesson. Right, all right. Thank you. All right. All right. Dr. Hodges, um, 
can you speak on how you had to grow into being that good manager? He talks about it in his book. He wasn't always the good one. I was. According to his book. I, 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 was, I was a terrible boss. Um, when we get out of vet school, right, T? They don't teach you about money. They don't teach you. So that's why I implore you to read and learn this thing. They don't teach you how to be a boss. All of a sudden, I'm in charge of all these people. So what's the first thing you think? Is it my way or the highway? Right. But I mean, that's that's not how successful businesses run. That's not how family runs, especially especially a business like mine. I mean I'm very dependent on the people. Y'all stand y'all say, hey. Tammy, the little girl right there. Well Andrea, I'm gonna go to her first. Andrea came to me as a little country girl from Macon County. She graduated from Fort Valley State from the Tech program. All right. Uh, well, how long have you been there? 17 years. I mean, think about that. 17 years. Only been, we only been in business about 20. The little girl there, 16 years. Now, this young lady right here is a special one. Oh, hey, Ariana. I want to talk about you. But Ariana is a product of Fort Valley as well. She came, came along. But summer, summer, um, summer is different. Some, I mean, when you talk about faith, seriously, I mean, it, it, it catches me off guard. So summer sends me this, this uh, resume. So I noticed a name on there. Do you remember we learned about the American Medical Center in New York? And you know, we, they talk about how big this hospital is and everything. I mean, we talk in New York City, so I instantly recognize the name. I'm thinking she's who it is, da, 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 da. So she sends me this resume from New York. Okay, well, let's, so I'm assuming she has family here, move here, or live here now. Some of them are still in New York. She comes down here and interview. Say, okay, you got a job, but you live in New York. Some are moved down here on faith. Mm. On faith. Mm. She can't. I mean, she 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 became part of our family. On faith. I mean, she don't know nobody. I mean, really, she, she, you know anybody yet, girl? No. I mean, she just know us. She, 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 I mean, she, it's just on faith. She came, she worked for us, she became family. Now she part of my family, I love her today. Oh. So, that's what, that's what life is all about. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that Terrence and I talked about. That's more more important than money or anything. Is what we've created. I think last count, man, we was up to maybe come through the vet tech program and working through us. I don't know how many techs, but I know we up to like thirty eight veterinarians have come through and gone on to become veterinarians over the years. All right. That's pretty strong. That's wonderful. <laughs> First adventure. In real estate, read by Ernst. I taught myself to buy real estate by reading books. I realized that I didn't need to be limited to being a vet. Yes. I, when I came across multiple streams of income by Robert Allen, it got me excited. Mr. Allen spent over 20 years working with successful people. Multiple Streams of Income is an ideal book. It opened my eyes to new possibilities that just what I was looking for, ideas on how I could diversify my income. I wanted to find another business or other businesses that would bring in regular income. My first opportunity as a real estate investor came through a chance to help a good friend and fraternity brother. That's me. <laughs> he was a school teacher at the time from Cordell, Georgia, a very poor community where 41.6% of the population is below the poverty line. Ernest wanted to move to Warner Robins and he needed a place to stay. I told him how much the homes were in Warner Robins and my response was, man, <laughs> I don't know if I can afford that. He said, I've always wanted to buy real estate. How about if I find you a house, fix it up, 
would you be willing to move in? I said, sure. When he bought the first rental property in 2004, uh, I was ready to rent. He paid about $60,000 and he put an additional $10,000 of cost in the construction. And myself and my wife and my son, who's a senior here at Fort Valley State, and, and my wife and I both graduated from the Fort Valley State. It, it made us feel like uh, we had accomplished something. Coming from a small area like Cordia and moving to the big city. I could honestly <laughs> sit here for hours and I could talk about Dr. Hodges from so many different aspects of life. Um, he saw something in me, I guess that I didn't see in myself. Um, I was interested in becoming a member of the Omega Psi Phi fraternity. He personally took me under his wings uh, to make sure that my GPA was where it needed to be. Uh, I used to hear my grandmother say, uh, you're only as good as the company that you keep. And, and once I started running with uh, Dr. Hodges, and men like Dr. Hodges, I became an honor student. All right. uh, and, and, and I've been lifted because of who this guy is. And it's amazing, y'all. Y'all hear about him and Dr. Ferguson. I met, and, and one thing about Doc, the friends he had back in school are still his friends now. I met Dr. Ferguson about 25, 23 years ago. With the, with, he was the first black guy I've ever seen with Cherokee G. So I forgot about that. <laughs> but it's amazing that, that, that this guy, we used to scrape up $3.50, so $1.75 a piece, to go to Big Chick and, and, and get a meal. And, and to go from, from, from that and that white stanza, all leaking everywhere, to this young man sitting in front of me that, that I can call. He loves myself, he loves my family. Um, as his aunt Jackie said, my, my dad, I have, and my dad is very sick. And um, he's giving, receiving treatments in, uh, in Tampa, Florida. Dr. Hodges is sponsoring those trips to Florida. I didn't ask him to do it because fortunately now I can afford to. Uh, but that's the kind of that's the kind of man that he is. Um, it's amazing to me that somebody that I could be so close to an age that I could look up to so much. Mm -hmm. I aspire to be like Dr. Hodges in a lot of ways. Uh, he gets on my nerves. <laughs> you know, he speaks in riddles. You know, every, everything is an open-ended statement, an open-ended question but there's always a method uh, to the madness. And it's amazing that I sit up here um, with somebody that I love like a brother, and we're speaking on how he's affected a room full of people, a community, uh, a college, and it's amazing, you know, it, it just goes back to you are only as good as the people that you hang around. That's right. Uh, my grandmother said, make this comment, boy, you're using the bathroom in high cotton now. Um, it, it's good that I don't have to borrow from Peter to pay Paul at this point in my life. And a lot of those lessons I learned from uh, Dr. Hodges. And I'm very, very fortunate uh, to be up here with such an humble and, and intelligent guy. He downplays his intelligence, uh, but make no mistake about it, this guy is a cool genius. Trust me, you don't take $3.50 or $1.75 and make millions. He don't play lottery. He takes chances, intelligent chances, and I know him, and I feel like if I stick around long enough, I'll become a millionaire. All right. All right. All right. You're only as good as the people you hang around. 
One more time. You're only as good as the people you hang around. Amen. All right. Want to speak on that? I mean, I mean, and, and that's, that works both ways. I mean, this guy's been my friend for a long time. I mean, you know, all of Karen, Paul, and, and people as I look around the room, it, it works both ways. Um, stand up, Jesse. For people who read, there is a section I, I didn't have him read, but I did tell him to come because he was actually working on my roof, one of my roofs tonight. So I said, just show up. So if you read the book, until if you read, and I talk about the old gentleman with the well room, and he'll be on the top of a, a house uh -huh. doing the roof with a hat on, that's uh -huh. Jesse. <laughs> but it's it's all about good friendship. Jesse Jesse has my back. I mean, it's all about building a team. You know, I mean, seriously, I can literally call this man. I mean, he, he Jess, how many roofs have you put on for me, baby? So, I mean, he does a roof, he does everything, but he know if he call me, I got it. He, and if I call him, he got me, whatever it is. So it's all about setting up a team. Setting up a team, setting up a friendship. It, it, and it got to work both ways. I mean, friendship can't work one way. Right. No All right, you, you want to say something, Jess? Hold on, Jess. Hold on, Jess. Hold on, hold on, Jess. Yeah, come on, Jess, because we want to hear what you're saying, baby. Come on. Here you go. When I first met Doc, he said, I'm a veterinarian. I said, okay, Doc, you must go to school in Tuskegee. He said, yeah, how do you know? I said, well, I do my good work in Tuskegee. And I started telling him things about Tuskegee and how great it was, this and that, that. And he used to look at me like, how, how could you know? You were from Pickering. I said, well, I'm the best of the best. He <laughs> tried a few times, you know. I said, Doc, why are you talking to me like that? He said, oh, I thought I was supposed to. <laughs> but, you know, we've been great friends ever since, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I guess it happened one day. I was that around. And I was working. But like the end thing, had everything I needed. And I sit down and I'm complaining and I was talking. And I said, No, I don't even know where I was born. The only thing I would do is serve, serve, serve everybody. And I said, You know what? I'm going to stop serving right now. I'm going to start serving privately. Because serving just ain't good enough. You got to serve privately. And I stood up with my eyes open. Like everything it was to know, everything it was to, you know, I could see. I've been walking straight ever since. All right. You gotta serve proudly. <laughs> serve my good no serve proudly. Okay, thank you. Give him a hand, everybody. And Jesse really, really would be on the roof looking just like that. I know. <laughs> when no one else is looking, read by Dr. Hodge. Being a man. Being a man is doing the right thing when no one else is looking. Many of my personal values were shaped by my family, fraternity, the church, and other people I've been fortunate enough to meet. I've helped people when I've heard they didn't have enough to eat, but no one else knew about it. Distressed mothers have called me about their kids failing in school, and I've reached out to those kids. Without real mo male role models, young men are rudderless. I've had kids come to my home for a day or two so I could talk to them. Being a man is taking responsibility for it. You do. It is being a martyr for a cause. In 2015, when I heard about the shooting death of Jamil Anderson, an eight-year-old, it broke my heart. It happened in Indian Oaks apartment complex in Fort Valley, which is next door to what we used to call, used to be the trap. Jamil was watching TV at the apartment of his mother's boyfriend when someone shot through the front door and killed him. Five men were charged with murder, but that wasn't, that wasn't going to bring Jamil back. I was so angry. This sort of thing just didn't happen when I was growing up. Guns, was a, guns were a rarity back then. People used to fight, but the next day they patched up their differences. The community was falling apart, and I had to give it to the people in Fort Valley.
for a better future. With the help of my classmate and friend, Henry Howard, I held a rally in the valley. Over 500 people came together to mourn Jamil's death. We talked about how our community can stop the violence. We provided free chicken, soft drinks. We had speakers to come. It was so sad that it took this terrible event for people to come together to make a difference. But community support shows that people care. There's hope for our children. And hope for the better is the first step in making our community safe. That was, uh, that was tough. Um, we had these school shootings yesterday. And uh, I mean, we just we just can't get immune to this stuff. I mean, it's just I mean, I, I know you guys are on Facebook and all this stuff, and you kind of see some of the stuff that we didn't have. So it kind of hits us in the heart a little bit more. Not not saying you don't care, but it starts with y'all. Y'all, it starts with you guys. I mean, it's only it's only so much Bernard Hodges can do. I mean, you in the community, you see people. You just first you gotta care. If you don't care, I mean, that's where it starts. I mean, when that kid got killed, I, I was I was home. I could have chilled in my house, did whatever I wanted to do, flew somewhere, go to Miami, to the beach. Or the, but I just had to do something. Because this, this is my community. Right. And, and you know, it, it's yours now, and wherever you're from, it's, it's your community. And if, if you don't care, then what happens one day if somebody shoots through your front door? So just always remember, always don't 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 become immune to this stuff. Don't don't look at the TV and say, ah, that's just another killing shoot. Always have a heart, always remain humble, and always remember that it could be you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's so true. Well, BJ. <laughs> we'll hear his passage. Gratitude. Oh gratitude. For many people, their pets are their only family. Multiple times I've been offered to be beneficiary of pet owners' wills because my care of their pets and their relationship with them has meant so much. I've known some since the beginning of Critic Fixture when I was struggling. They asked me if the business is okay, can I afford to eat, or can I afford to keep lights on? It's funny how they still view me as fresh out of school, a much younger and poorer person than I am today. But I love it because they're my extended family who wants me to succeed. When I was younger, I never knew the pleasure of giving back because I didn't have much. My favorite rapper, Jay-Z, said it well. And I can't help the poor if I'm one of them. So I got rich and gave back to me. That's the win. Win. For a moment of clarity, the Black Album 2003. Recently, my mother fell and broke her hip. After she got to the hospital, she went to a rehab facility called The Lodge. The facility is very nice, but after staying for over two months, she was ready to leave. If you aren't walking and aren't able to care for yourself, the next place you usually go is to a nursing home. My mother was worried about what the future held for her. I didn't tell her what I was doing. I wanted it to be surprised. I was finalizing the interior of a new condominium I had bought for her. I was asking her about her favorite colors, what kind of furniture and lighting she would like if the money was no object. But I didn't let on while I was asking these questions. I found the proper property about five doors down from her good friend and my gum on his face, and then five minutes away from my house. I bought it at a great price and rehabbed it. I replaced all the doors with larger ones, made everything wheelchair accessible, furnished it in her favorite colors, and bought her a hospital bed. I planted her favorite rose bushes and put a canopy on the back porch so she could sit out and drink coffee, even when it was raining. When her nurse wheeled her in front end for the first time, I said, this is your place. You can spend the rest of your life here, and you have your own nurse. You won't have to go any place you don't want to. She burst into tears. I feel blessed to be able to spoil my mom. My dad was generous and spoiled me with, with what he had, even if, it was, if he had little. But the lessons he taught me about life have been invaluable. I feel blessed to spoil my son, VJ, and pass along the life lessons that my dad taught me. I must admit, my son is a terrific kid, much more than I ever was. He hasn't made a, grow below, a grade below A. I love my son with all my heart. He is the reason I get up and work hard each day, so he will have a head start with tools that to be much more successful than me. He recently took the SAT for the Duke Talent Identification Program, scoring in the top 5% of 7th graders in the country. 
But if you say storage, folks, he plans to follow his dad's footsteps so they can move near you. I'm successful enough to have the resources to choose what I want to do. I can go where I want, I can dress any way I choose, and I can travel. I can buy material goods, but one more car or a bigger house won't make me happier. I've been cheered over the years. What's meaningful for me is having the resources to help other people live a better life. And to live a better life, you must understand personal finance, what money is and how it works. Sometimes working two jobs, building my veneer business, and creating a real estate empire. I've ridden the storms up, I've ridden them down. I've suffered defeat and I've known victory, but I've hit more home runs than I've been put out. I put, I put many people to work and provided houses for others. I helped people and contributed to my community and made a lot of friends. Two years ago, I talked to Terrence about what we want to do in the next phase of our life. He's in the building and selling cars. We both want to cut back on our hours. I'll never leave without making sure Critter Fix is good and my clients are taken care of. Critter Fix is my baby. I plan to hire more veterinarians and cut back on work a little and enjoy the fruits of my labor. I want to spend time with my son and teach him how to become a man. I've always been engaged in vet, I'll always be engaged in vet med, but right now, I'm busting my butt at the hospital just like I did in my 20s. I do the work of three veterinarians. I want to cut back knowing that everything is working smoothly without me. At my stage in life, my values are involved. I can buy things, but I want time. In 20 years, I've never been away from Critter Fix in more than four days in a row. I don't know what it feels like to take a week away from work. I've never done it. So what about the future? I don't have to work as hard. It's not about money. It's about my life plan. I'm looking for more balance. The other day, I was looking for some paint for my apartment. It's a task I enjoy, but my phone wouldn't stop ringing. Being always in demand is exhausting. I was called in two times to treat two dogs for snake bites. The first 10 times snake bites were exciting. I want to make sure the dog is okay, and the pet owner is too. But then I want to go back and buy my paint. Time is a non-renewable -re resource. It has become more valuable. I'm willing to take a salary cut or work less just to have less stress and enjoy more. My real estate will supplement my income. I just want to backpack through Europe. I want to visit every football, baseball, and basketball stadium in America. I'm realizing that less is more. What success like looks like is depending on where you are in your life plan. I want to continue my standard of living. Enjoy traveling and learn lessons still life has in store for me. 
I want to teach people about business, talk to groups, and give back. I'm grateful for all the people who's helped me become who I am today. And my message is better on yourself. One more time, everybody, Dr. Bernard Hodges. I know we've, um, we're right in that one hour of starting, so which is good. Um, we have time to maybe take about three questions. Is that good? Maybe three questions. If you all have any that you'd like to ask Dr. Hodges, now is your time. Yes. Just make sure you project. situation that uh, some things, certain things were, were promised and uh, the, the gentleman couldn't deliver and, and, and that's understandable being a boss now I look back and I understand the position he was in but uh, you know I've, I've learned all early on I mean somebody gonna be the boss why do I mean Somebody who owns multiple businesses, how do you prioritize each day your most important strategies to effectively use your free time and your downtime to live a balanced life? It's very, it's, it's very important, and, and you make a, a great point. But there it goes. You got to have a team. You know, I mean, and 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 you have to prioritize. You know, you can you can talk to the kids or talk to the family, but if you know if a toilet goes bad, you got to have somebody to call. You gotta have have people around you. You gotta have a team. I, I literally have my my phone is a Rolodex. I mean, they could attest. They always say, "Dog, God, dog." In between places, you looking at your phone, your tip. Don't say it here, son. But seriously, you you do have to prioritize. I mean, there are certain things that take a priority. But but you you know you have to decide. You know, do do I want one job and live here, or do you want several streams of income and live here? I kind of like living. Here. But just prioritize. I mean, it, it can be done. You know, I'm sure you play video games and do different things. I mean, same thing. You know, I mean, you 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 you, you can do multiple things. It's about multitasking. And I'm, I'm sure you know everybody here is in college, so everybody here is multitasking. You go to a football game, you study, you hang out, you learn the latest rap music. Then I'm sure most of you guys can recite. It's just about what you what you prioritize and what you think is important. But it's very possible. Okay, I got a quick question, Dr. Hodges. So um, tonight, the, most of the passages that we read uh, dealt with your life experiences. But also in this book, he tells you a little bit about money. Okay, so could you maybe just for these young people that are in here, what kind of advice would you give them to learn about money? What should they know right now as college students about money? Because there's a lot in here about managing money as well. Money, I mean, money management is, is pretty, pretty simple. I mean, I, I, you know, I won't, it's not this simple, but really, save more than you spend. I know, I know that sounds crazy, but when you get, when you start, get out in the world and start making money, you have school loans and all these things. You got to pay yourself first. Start putting things up. Jacket, jacket. I mean, when I when I start, I would put money up. I mean, start saving. Put your put your money aside. Start learning about other streams of income. Everybody hears about the stock market, right? Anybody in here know what the what a ticker symbol is? Nobody. Serious. I I can teach you a ticker symbol in two minutes. Okay. Everybody go to Walmart, right? Right? Yeah. Walmart's ticker symbol is WMT. So simply that simply means when you go when you look at a stock, right? And you look at Walmart stock, it doesn't say Walmart, it says WMT. Learn about ticker symbols. Just, just start basic. Those kind of things are how you, you, you invest and learn money. It's very, not everybody know what a ticker symbol is, right? You learn it in 30 seconds. Take it upon yourself and learn these things. That's how you build wealth. Learn how to simply learn the small things, keep building on them, and you should do well. So, do you say, hey, 
Do you think buying some Amazon stock right now is good? Because you know with the stock market sort of falling, is this a, I, I'm asking for a personal reason. <laughs> I, I, I hate to give personal stock tips, but since I know you, I'll look. Uh, uh, no, I looked at Amazon stock today, it was 1400 It's not a bad stock, but but listen, all right, young lady, or gentleman, who, who think they're the most fashionable lady in here? Right, somebody raise Somebody in school. Who, who shops? Who goes shopping? Stand up. You stand up. Stand up, right? Stand up. Let me show you something. Right? And, and this is going to go, right, this going to go to what you're saying. And this is what you got to think, right? So, when you go shop, do you look for a set? Yes. Okay, you look for a set. So you see this nice dress, and it was $250, right? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Well, listen, 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 listen. So you go, you go, you see this nice, nice dress. It was two hundred fifty dollars, but now it's fifty dollars on clearance rate, right? Mm -hmm. So we jump all over, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're gonna go back to your question. When Amazon stock is fifteen hundred and going up, you want to get it, right? No, I want to get it now because it's tanking. All right. So when it, when the stock goes down, it's on sale. A good stock. So I, I like it when the stock market go down. Yeah. I'm all over. It. On days that it's good, you know anybody ever heard of Warren Buffett? Yeah. Warren Buffett says, "Buy when there's blood, blood on the street." I love when there's blood on the street. I'm I'm emptying my bank account, buying everything I can. So that's you know those are the things you got to learn about. But you got to learn that because it takes. But you might have some stock that's bloody too. <laughs> So you gotta learn how to how to kind of learn learn how it goes. But don't take that literally. Now don't y'all go out here saying he loved blood on the street. Now that's no, don't simply, take that simply, literally. Simply, simply in the stock. That's right. In the street will be washed. <laughs> And I, I'd be remiss to, uh, I've, I've talked about Dr. Davis. You got probably one of my toughest uh, teachers I've, I've taken. I mean, even with the vet school, but he prepared. At the time, I was like, man, what is this dude doing? It's Dr. Steele. Oh. <laughs> you don't get a, a better English teacher than Ms. Holloway?
he references several books because he studied and showed himself proof for himself. So don't wait for somebody to tell you something. Go and read. He took it upon himself to read. Okay? So we want to thank Dr. Hodges. This has been excellent. It has been everything. Did you all enjoy yourself? Did you all learn some things? Did you all know the importance of surrounding yourself with great people? Right? Right? Did you all understand the importance of being humble? Did you all understand the importance of being gracious? And what you put out. You'll be blessed tenfold. That's good. Just give it away. Just give it away. You never lack, do you? Never. Never lack. One more time, Dr. Bernard Hodges. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Sodexo. Thank you, Hot Library, for co-hosting. Thank you, University Advancement, and thank you all for coming out. And to our golden ticket holders, golden ticket holders, come on up and get your free book from Dr. Hodges. Golden ticket holders.